Oh, hey. Welcome back to Comic Book News. I'm Dan Shaheen. Today we're going to talk about what else? Comic books, right? Well, we're going to talk about uh, a few comics in particular. X-Men Fantastic Four number one, first of a four-issue miniseries featuring the all-new X-Men and how they tie into the Fantastic Four. We're going to look at Batman number 88, uh, continuing in this new run uh, written by Tinian. We'll look at Captain America The End, a one-shot written and drawn by Eric Larson. We'll look at The Man Who Effed Up Time, number one, by John Lehman and Carl Mostert. Usagi Yojimbo, number eight. And we'll wrap it all up with a look back in time at a Green Lantern, number one, the facsimile edition. All of this and a lot more on today's comic book news. Hey, welcome back to the show. Today we're going to talk about uh, some comics, man. We're going to talk about the comics I read this week. You know, um, I goofed up. I, I went to my shop, Scruffy Nerd, Nerd Herder in Eureka, and I uh, picked up all my comics, and I got home, and I said, I'm missing one. I'm missing, what am I missing? I know there was something coming out this week, uh, and it was, what was it? X-Men Fantastic Four number one. So luckily they were open until 10, a bunch of dudes there hanging out playing games and stuff. So uh, I went in and picked it up. Uh, I read this book. I'm not sure that I'm glad that I did. You know, I had a bunch of disappointing comics this week, but a couple of gems stood out. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about them all briefly. Batman 88 by Tinian. This whole designer thing, Tinian's run. This feels like, you know, Tinian was writing detective comics. And it feels like this was like a run of detective comics that... Uh, uh, when they did the quick shuffling and got Tom King out of the picture, I'm I'm guessing this was like a Tinian detective story that they brought over. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but it feels that way. Captain America: The End by Eric Larson, written and drawn by one guy, single cartoonist, right? Eric Larson, um, f famous for the Savage Dragon and Image Comics, cut his teeth on uh, Spider Man at Marvel. Uh, we'll look at this book. I'm not sure why it exists. It wasn't awful for sure. I liked the singular vision of Eric Larson's cartooning, but I just didn't quite understand it and didn't really like it a whole lot. We'll look at it. The man who effed up time. I've had more requests for uh to review more indie stuff, so I'm gonna mix it in. You know, sometimes my indie reviews would get not too many views and not too many people are interested, so I'm gonna mix it in with the mainstream stuff this way in these multi-review formats. I hope you like it and will let me know if you do or don't in the comments. Usagi Ojimbo number eight, you know, tried and true, always on time, looking great. We'll talk about why uh, this was, uh, I saved this one for last of the new comics, and I'm pretty glad that I did. Uh, and then Green Lantern number one facsimile edition. Man, nothing says awesome sci-fi uh, 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 Silver Age relaunch of a Golden Age character like Fight and Giant Puppets, right? It's a classic cover. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's Gil Kane artwork on the inside. It's uncredited um, in the comic itself. Let's see. No, yeah, uh, Gil Kane... Um, and also Murphy Anderson does work on the inside, so I'm not sure who did the cover. Um, but we'll look at it and why I liked it. But, you know, wait, 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 right? You know where we're going. Why talk about this when we can look at them all for real? You know what I mean? Not digital, but actually put our hands on them in the Million Dollar Comics can. All right. Oh, Million Dollar Comics can. We're talking about X-Men Fantastic Four number one uh, and some other stuff too, right? Let's let's look at uh, X-Men Fantastic Four because that's kind of like maybe what brought some of you in there. This is the, 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 uh, the book and the title, the description of this video, so it's probably the main review. Um, now, the whole concept behind this is that um, one of the Fantastic Four... Or, or rather one of their children, Franklin Richards, is a mutant, right? He was born 
and he's got superpowers that and he was a human he had human parents granted they were mutated via cosmic rays they are not mutants now this apparently is franklin richards i did like call me crazy but wasn't franklin richards blonde isn't he blonde like i looked at this and i thought oh is amadeus cho in this book because seriously this looks like an asian dude to me i don't know but that's Franklin Richards, and that's how he's drawn throughout the book. And so we get to see a little bit of recap of like who he is. He's Franklin Richards. He's the son of the most powerful people. He's got these super crazy powers, but now they're draining. And, and his dad has been trying to figure out why and not doing a great job at figuring that out. And, uh, and then we get an introduction. Uh, we, we see who's coming in. It's the new X-Men from Krakoa, the Marauders, Kitty Pride. Now, Kitty had a connection to uh, Franklin Richards as a kid that they discuss. And so Xavier's like, I think it would be great if you were to come with us uh, when we try and convince Franklin that he should be with us here in Krakoa. And so that's what they go and do. Again, does this look like Franklin Richards? What am I missing, guys? Did I miss some... Re I haven't been keeping up with FF continuity. Am I missing something? He was aged up and is now a young man is what they say. Similar to the uh, Jonathan Kent scenario over on in uh, the Distinguished Competition. But um, I don't know what's going on here exactly why, and they don't really explain it. Um, they do talk a little bit here about the theoretical source uh, for superhumans in relation to the Fantastic Four. That, that, that they have this power that stems someone from this something called the God Force. And at first I was like, well, would Reed Richards or scientists buy into something called the God Force? But then again, they had the God Particle and stuff like that. So, okay, I think that's what they're playing off of. Um, so here we get into some, you know, Franklin hanging out with Uncle Johnny or uh, Uncle Ben, rather, the thing. And talking about, you know, isn't it weird that Reed, you know, he, can't, he never could cure you, Ben, and he can't fix my power thing. Like, how come he can fix every other freaking problem in the world? Like, literally everything. Except us. Valid question, I guess. Uh, before Uncle Johnny shows up. And then, um, what do we get? So we get the X-Men. Instantly, you know, anytime two super groups meet up, it's instantly going to turn into a fight, right? And so that's sort of where this starts going. And you got to get some action in here. And honestly, it's pretty fun to see Invisible Woman against Magneto. That's never not, not a fight I really ever thought about or envisioned, but like, kind of interesting the way their powers could interplay we don't we don't get a lot of that in here but because what we do get is kitty's like you know what frank let's just get out of here and let's go talk i thought that was pretty cool because they're just like you know let's go bro out old pal but let's talk about the artwork by the way rachel and terry dodson the dodsons is a husband and wife team really beautiful artwork right this is Art wise, I think is is at least starting to live up to what we should expect to see out of an X book compared to the other, all the other X books. Maybe even can, except for the main X Men book and even some issues of that. Maybe um, this is head and shoulders above that. That's not to say it's the very greatest X Men artwork or even the greatest Dodson artwork I've ever seen, but um, it's solid, gr good storytelling, good action, fun to look at. I'm giving it a, a I'm giving it a thumbs up. Um, so of course, you know, we got to get some fights between superheroes and we got to get, uh, teenage resentment as Franklin tries to go through the gate. He decides he wants to go to Krakoa and then Reed reveals that he secretly tinkered with him. So a long time ago and it masks his mutant gene, which prevents him from using the gates to go to Krakoa. A little bit contrived. But what are you going to do? Um... You know, so uh, family fun and pathos, Fantastic Four, decent stuff, f fun to read. I'm interested. And then we close on a cliffhanger uh, with, you know, we got Valeria and, and Franklin stowed away on the Marauder ship to get to Krakoa because they can't go through the gates and neither can Kitty. Again, a little bit contrived to get them on this boat when, like, there's all these other teleporters and there's so many other ways they could get there. Okay. Well, what do you know? Battle on, drama on the high seas, none other than, uh, you know who, Dr. Doom. So, cool. I'm in. You know what? This is fun. This is good. Great artwork that uh, elevates uh, a, a, a story that's, you know, 
pretty good. Better than just decent. Um, what, what should we talk about next? Let's talk about uh, a story that a book that was not great. Batman 88. I'm not going to go belabor this except to say I hate the art. I hate the treatment of the Riddler. I hate the story elements. It's all about gadgets and being a de and designs and things being designed and new gadgets for Batman because Lucius Fox has taken over as his Alfreds and who's really more now like his Q to Batman's James Bond, but actually almost more like just magical technology guy. So for instance, they you know there's no Batmobile nearby, so he says, "Hey, take this thing and put it on that car." Which is his car, Lucius's car, and it'll take over whatever car you put it on and mask it with a Batmobile hologram. So this is your emergency in case you can't get away. You can always steal somebody's car. Okay, I'll buy the maybe taking over, but it's like I'm using the Wayne Tech components in the car and taking over. It's too much magical pseudoscience for me. And if they really, you know, this is not what I want. I want Warren Ellis's grounded batman in over in the batman's grave and that's where i'll be reading it so we get more stuff with this whole thing was a plan from way back when between with the joker and the penguin and the riddler and catwoman right and they're all like okay if batman finds out you were involved in this whole thing catwoman it will spell the end of could it spell the end of your whatever who cares there's a batman catwoman book about to come out so obviously that's not this is not going to spell the end of their relationship unless that's all just a big setup for a switcheroo. Spoiler alert, it's not. So there's no stakes here. Um, we get a pretty cool thing where, okay, they, they've got this new prison because Arkham Asylum is like a revolving door. And so they locked up all those assassins, including Deathstroke and some other people. And the Penguin is there, was there, and uh, now they're trying to escape, and they're using Penguin as hostage. And he says, look, I'm going to cut his throat. And you got nobody to help you, so you're going to have to, you know, do it. And he just, instead of, like, toying with it, he just does it. He's, like, slices his throat. He's like, look, he, he's going to bleed out. There's nobody here to help you. You got no Robins and no Batmobiles and whatever. So, you know, if you want to save him, you're going to have to stay. We're going to split. I thought that was okay. That was pretty ruthless and, and bloodthirsty and not something we're used to seeing. Um then again, I hate their ver this version of the Penguin here, which is all about gadgets again and just more gadgety umbrellas. Granted, that is a Penguin thing, but it's sort of a cheesy old Penguin thing. Uh, meanwhile, there's something going on. Catwoman was confronting the grave of the Joker who's dead, but we know the Joker's not dead because we've seen him in the previous issues being teased. And then they're talking about how a they say a bunch of bodies were found with burned alive with clown masks on at the at the amusement park and like okay if you burn them to death wearing plastic clown masks like they had on you how would you know they were clown masks or even or what they were silly not great writing i'm not super happy with this oh and an appearance at the end of ooh harley quinn this is gonna spice things up with everybody's favorite character not mine I, i'm i think i'm out a batman Sorry, it took two non-Tom King issues to, for me to say ixnay on the Atman Bay. All right, let's go to what? Let's go to the man who effed up time. Um, one, I didn't like the title. It's, it's okay. I don't like that you're calling it effed up in previews, but it's fucked up. Excuse my language, but it's not. Okay, that's confusing enough as it is. But appealing artwork you open it up and you're thrown right into the middle of the story just like a lot of comics that you read these days but pretty cool it's like a crazy mixed up time when like there's a fascist abraham lincoln regime and there's dinosaurs roaming the streets and what the heck have i done right and this is our main character here and we're gonna learn about his story through some really bad characterization there's like He's a, f I don't even, okay, his ex-roommate in college, his ex-roommate stole all of his info and he flunked out of college because he couldn't get funding for it to, f to fund it. And now they work at the same lab and he's a lab assistant there and his ex-roommate is an actual scientist with degrees and degrades him and calls him janitor boy. It's really dumb. I don't know. It's just so ham-fisted characterization of this guy's 
the underdog, and this guy's so evil and bad that <clears throat> we can guess there's going to be bad things happening to him, I think. And anyway, he goes, the guy ends up in a bar, and who shows up at the bar? You know, they reveal that they've got some time travel stuff, and who shows up at the bar but himself? He shows up at the bar, to, meets himself, and tells him to go use that time machine and make his life better, right? And it's the number one rule is do not fuck up time. Now, to me, this immediately made me think of Rick and Morty. I don't know if this was it, that influenced this or not, but they have the time cops and they would always say, don't fuck with time. You don't fuck with time and then they beat you up and they're time cops. This feels like he's heard that and saw that and sort of that was an inspiration for this. I guess it's not a rip off, but it, to call the book that and it's, I don't know, rant, rant off. I'm done with that. Um, so we get the idea. He messed with time. And we all know you mess with time. Butterfly effect. Ray Bradbury, right? You go back a million years, you squash a butterfly. The world's going to be unrecognizable because of, you know, everything, the changes that spawned from that. So essentially, like, you, some something happened. He went back in time and he's come back and he has spawned this uh, fascist, regime of abraham lincoln worshipers and you're kind of and then these time robot cops show up again time police sort of again reminding you of rick and morty and they're like you have to go clean this up or else and so we're set up with our with what our book's gonna be and we're getting there and i was like okay interesting but then there's a little bit of back matter that redeems some of the stuff that i didn't like there's this stuff like a memo to the asshole guy, his ex roommate, talking about like you can't call people janitor boy, and like, all right, they actually address that. And then this smarty pedia here, um, it, it talks about um, how in this world, you know, where uh, Abraham Lincoln was not assassinated, he was John Wilkes Booth was stopped by a tr mysterious guy who appeared out of nowhere. Who is this? Is this our main character? It's not clear if he it was him who did that or not because they don't explicitly say that. I don't even know if it's really implied. I guess I don't, I'm not sure if that's going to be revealed or someone else who used or will use the time machine. It's kind of the problem with time machine stories. That's why when they're fun like this and just sort of ludicrous, it's it's kind of cool. So the idea is that Abraham Lincoln did not get assassinated. And so he basically became the emperor of the United States. He became like the forever president. And then now his children became the the, the emperors who ruled in his wake, which I thought, okay, all right, I kind of like it. And then we get uh, some other back matter stuff that's fun and added to it and actually like made me like it more and made me like this comic as a complete package a little bit more, I think, for its inclusion. So I'm going to say... Um, worth a shot. I liked it. Not not great. It's not. It doesn't feel... It feels like a comic, though. You know, I mean, it feels like it's doing stuff that's only really easy to do in a comic or or a movie that would have an insane budget. So let's that's what's great about comics. Let's throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. And they're doing it. All right, let's go. Captain America: The End. Eric Larson, written and drawn. Okay, uh, not this cover though. This cover looks like uh, who's that look? It looks like Clayton Crane to me. And I think that's who it is. Um. I'll bet dollars to donuts it's Clayton Crane. Anyway, I'm going to open this guy up, and we're going to see... Um, oh, what's this? Strange Academy. Obviously, Marvel moving in that young adult's direction as well, doing stuff with Doctor Strange and like a Harry Potter meets Doctor Strange thing. Anyway, I'm going to talk more and more about the ads I'm seeing in the comics as I see the comic companies tacking and changing direction and, and who they're marketing their stuff towards. Okay, Eric Larson, story and art. I love it. I love when a cartoonist does their own stuff. This is great. Obviously, heavily influenced by Jack Kirby. I mean, Larson is, and if you're doing a Captain America book, maybe you probably should be. Um, clean that up a little bit. Um, but, on the other hand, this story is so generic. It's like, it's the future. Everyone is zombies, but these zombies are Red Skull zombies that came because blah, 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 Red Skull released a thing, and now everybody's zombies, and now there's a few people who are not zombies, and Captain America's going to band together with them and try to help them, 
and try and find a cure for the zombie thing and they look for it and Captain America says a lot of inspiring things along the way and they look for the cure and they find a MODOK and they fight the MODOK and eventually it turns out that there is a cure and that cure is what? It's Captain America's blood. He finds it out accidentally when he pulls a piece of shrapnel out of his own leg and stabs a zombie that was his friend with it and that cures the zombie. Um, this guy, he came back and he's like, it's your blood, Cap, it's your blood. So now he's like, okay, we're going to serve out your days as like, we're going to use every drop of your blood slowly. We're going to keep you alive. Cap's like, take it all, take all my blood. Cure everybody you can. He's like, look, man, you're worth more alive because we can, like, you can keep, your body keeps making more blood. You know what I mean? Um, and so we can cure everybody. And so they do and they start winning the world back. And, and Cap now, his whole thing is he's under guard. He's an old man and he stands there and he gives blood. And they're like, this may sting a little. Are you ready to give some more blood? I was born ready. This may sting a little. It doesn't hurt a bit. It feels like freedom. Not great. Not great writing. The artwork I enjoyed for what it was. I like Larson's cartooning. It's fun and action-y and okay. This doesn't feel like his best, like he's putting his most care into it. I think this, the end thing, there's a bunch of the end books that have been coming out. Um, and they're probably just, you know, it's one of those stunts where they put them out like weekly or something. And then they're going to collect it all together to probably trade paperback. And they're all loosely affiliated one shots of varying quality. This is the only one that even like looked worth looking at. Disappointing. So, so far it's been pretty mediocre stuff. The man who effed up time I liked. And then we got to Usagi Yojimbo. And, and man, I was not disappointed. As you do part one, I go, this is about tatami. What are tatami? Tatami are woven mats. The mats that people like to sit and pray on, I guess, in the temples and stuff and tea ceremonies. And I'm like, oh man, is this good? This is gonna be like a history lesson on making mats, and it is. But that ties into the story, and it's done so well, so masterfully. The cartooning is so effortless here to show something like this, show the detailed, researched, historical stuff of weaving these mats, and then making that a key point in the story. And I was taken by this splash page here in particular of how good. The new Usagi looks in color. I mean, I loved it in black and white, but Tom Luth is coming in and bringing in modern coloring techniques in a subtle way. It's not really flashy, but you can see the gradients and, and, and shading and the modeling and the lighting being done in the color work that just adds something to Usagi that was never there before. It was black and white, right? Not even gray tones, I don't think, most of the time in Usagi. So this was a real... Um, Maybe I'm wrong about that. I have to look. But anyway, um, this is a big change. Certainly not like modeled textures in in the, uh, uh, the in the coloring. And that adds a lot to it. And I'll say again that I predict that all of the early works of Usagi are going to be recolorized and collected eventually. Ooh, I recently picked up uh, the two cover two two volume hardcover set of Usagi Yojimbo, the Fanographics years, the very first earliest. Usagi stuff that is the greatest I'm, I'll bring it in and, and I'll do a review of that uh, volume soon I know I like Stan Sakai I like Usagi Yojimbo I can't stop talking about it but you know what I, I want I expected to sort of be bored and this be by the numbers but man the writing was good the story was engaging historical stuff woven in and not only that it's woven in deeply to the character of Usagi this current run is is it's just little bits in each issue has been Usagi is starting to question like how long he must remain loyal to um, the Lord he he, wor he he worked for, who was assassinated, right? Fought in this great battle where Usagi got the scar and became a Ronin. And now he's meeting up with that clan that was the enemy clan that they fought there. And he's seeing like, you know, some of the guys that even he fought with that were on his side have, you know, their lord was dead so to you know they got to feed their families so to be pragmatic they they joined the other side and it makes sense so he's starting to even question and he brings it up he's like you know how long do i have to do this 
this is clearly like a theme that's building. And I think we're going to see, hopefully not a conclusion like Usagi's going to end, but I think it'll be a major change in his life and sort of what his mission is as he's sort of like fulfilled his duty to his, his dead master. And I think that's kind of cool. It kind of reminds me of another book Sakai worked on, uh, Grew the Wanderer, where he's the, Stan Sakai was the letter on Grew the Wanderer, and there was a whole period marked the early period of Grew until Grew learned to read, and then there's everything that came after, and it was sort of a major change for the main character, which you don't always think about characters changing and characterization, particularly in a book like this that's run for decades and seems like a kiddie book or whatever. I don't know. Those moments mean something to me. I, I liked it. So anyway, uh, I'm not going to go into all the story. We've got the Neko Ninja Clan coming out, and 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 there's stuff that's bringing up Usagi's past and his old clan affiliation and his future loyalties, and it's and I'm loving it. I'm so glad that I subscribed to Usagi again because I had stopped reading the black and white ones. I'm not sure why. Maybe I planned to pick it up and trade and I never did. That just goes to show you, man. That's the power of monthly comics. I love subscribing to comics again. I'm so back into single issues. And that's a, a big reason why I started picking up facsimile editions. Because, man, to look at this, I mean, except for this, right? This is exactly how it looked on the newsstand in whatever year this came out, 1960. 60, 1960, okay? So pre-Marvel, uh, 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 you know, like this was the rebirth of the Silver Age. So Golden Age Green Lantern was a way different character. It had, well, a lot different looking, didn't have sci-fi roots. It was more mystical and his weakness was wood, okay? New Green Lantern, sci-fi based, Cool, snazzy costume. Uh, weakness is yellow. Uh, but everything's a lot more sci-fi and science-based, as we'll see. One thing that really stood out to me was all the little, like, public service stuff going on in here. There's stuff about free speech, and there's a lot of science stuff going on that I'll, I'll point out that they really brought up in the book. I don't know if they had to or they were trying to combat the idea of comics as bad for kids or whatever, but anyway... We get in here and we got Murphy Anderson art and, and, and Gil Kane art, I believe, in the second story. But it is a thing to behold. It is lovely to look at. It's not flashy like a modern style, but look how clean and crisp this looks, how readable it is. The story itself, this first story is, it, this is not Silver Age Green Lantern's first appearance, which was like showcase or something. I forget the issue. But put it in the comments if you know. Um, this is... But it recaps his origin because this is his first issue as a, is in his own solo book. And it recaps his origin with Abin Sir and blah, blah, blah. He was a test pilot. And I'm not even going to go into the stories. I'm just going to just point out what a loving thing it is. And then I'll point out these, these science pieces, the Nobel science winners. And they talk about like different Nobel scientists and what they brought to the table. I don't know. And I just thought it was something they don't even, wouldn't, don't even attempt to do anymore. Because it's not like there's no ads in these books. These books sold a lot. And they sold a lot of ads, too. Um, uh, one thing that was kind of cool, a, a very, like, tr nitpicky thing about Green Lantern that I thought was interesting. You know, usually Green Lantern is best, basically, it's like, his ring is like, a lot of writers and artists, they treat it it's like a force field thing. It just makes different shaped things. Boxing gloves and claws and ant whatever. Kyle Rayner makes them more, like, artistic and whatever kind of just different shapes but the ring can do so much more than that right like it can translate languages it can do mental things it can do other kinds of energy effects and stuff that you don't often see so in this book he's seeing the ring he's trying to use the ring directly on this creature and this creature has some kind of mental defense that is draining Hal's willpower so it's not working so what he decides to do instead is I'm gonna do it differently he's I'm gonna create liquid oxygen and spray it on him with the ring instead and that's going to freeze him and dampen his powers <coughs> anyway subtle so it's not something that you see modern green lantern do a lot of stuff like that it would be more like energy effects or do something he would bring in something else to freeze him or whatever he wouldn't do that is that interesting it is to me but i'm a nerd 
Um, so what else? Oh, so that story is told, and then we get to the main to the cover story. Um, we get a nice mailbag. Um, and then we get our main story, the menace of the giant puppet, which is kind of silly and kind of stupid. And I feel like this is another one of those examples of like back in the day they would kind of like come up with a crazy idea for a cover, and then the story would be written to like live up to that cover kind of thing. That's sort of what this feels like. But anyway, I see like for 1960, if you compare this to a lot of other DC artwork, especially the earlier stuff, this is dynamic and modern looking. It's really nice. Um, cool effects. His costume was cool then. This costume holds up to this day. Minor changes and tweaks that they've made that they made to it in the 70s and stuff made it a little bit better. I think stuff Neil Adams did do it. But again, it's a really cool design. Um, way cooler than the stupid Alan Scott red outfit. Um, so one thing that's another thing here is where like the guy, it's a it's a typical <clears throat> villain is a mad scientist. And Hal shows up and then he figures it out and he fights him. But he's like, he goes in and tries to attack him. And he's like, oh no, great Scott. In my anxiety to grab him, I didn't notice he's dressed all in yellow. Oh no, what am I going to do? <laughs> so like, he's got the most powerful like magical wishing ring space thingy in the world. But like yellow jumpsuit, can't touch this. But so what he ends up doing instead, and this is a little confusing. He goes, I will use my ring to direct this cord but the cords are colored green i don't know if they were colored that way originally so it's confusing and it makes it seem like those cords are coming out of his ring but i think what he's going for here is that he used the ring to wrap ropes around the guy's yellow suit and puppeteered him away okay fun and then everyone always ends with like sort of like back to hal jordan and he's making the move on uh on on carol and he's like, uh, oh, it's you, Hal Jordan. I was expecting. And in his thoughts, Green Lantern, I bet. It's a snap to get Carol to go for me as GL, but I'm determined to win her over as my real self, Hal Jordan. Who talks like that to themselves? I guess I do sometimes, once in a while. Um, so uh, anyway, today we talked about a bunch of comics and, and uh, uh, what was the best well, probably not that hard to figure out from all these choices. My favorite of the week was uh, Usagi Ojimbo. I gave this one um, uh, best continuing series of the year in our 2019 uh, wrap-up videos. If you haven't seen that, go check that out because I talk a lot more about Usagi. If you haven't heard enough about Usagi and don't realize that I like him, go check that video out. Um, you know what another thing I like is man I like all of you guys watching this video and gals uh, because uh, you've been supporting watching giving comments man there was a great comment on my last video lately I've been kind of down because I've been so busy I haven't been able to make a lot of videos family stuff work stuff and everything else my views have fallen a little bit and I just sort of losing my mojo a little bit and going like man what's happening and somebody wrote a really nice review where they said uh my uh, the show reminded them of sh TV shows from the 70s or 80s, except instead of like a cheesy car salesman host, it's got a guy who really likes comics and cares about comics. Man, you don't know how much that comment meant to me and means to me because that's exactly what I'm going for. I love those kind of old shows uh, with the with with the goofy graphics and a little bit of wacky goofiness thrown in there uh, amidst some serious reviews because I seriously love comics and I take them seriously and I review them seriously for you so um i've rambled enough thanks for watching uh if you haven't already please click the subscribe button we're, we're making our march to a thousand subscribers so i can get monetized and make like two or three bucks a month i'm hoping enough to buy like one comic a month that would be great if we could get to two that'd be awesome too we'll see anyway um thank you for that uh if you haven't subscribed click that bell for notifications please leave a comment let me know what you thought about any of the comics i reviewed tonight uh, and uh, we will see you when. We'll see you next time.